find your truths that are mysteries that are being revealed through your word. And Lord, fill our hearts and our minds with the truths that you want to bring to That we may go out into this world knowing our authority and knowing what you expect of us. And then through your Holy Spirit, help us to be obedient to that law and to do the things that you want us to do. Thank you for our giftings. Thank you for the blessing of our health. Thank you for our friendships and our families. Thank you for everything, Lord. We give you the praise and honor and glory. Bless Tom today. Amen. Give him your words to bring forth to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. That was good. I love that prayer. This is the last week for you. And it should be. Amen. It's going to be good. Last week we talked about an armed and gifted. We talked about speaking an oracle. And it was a bit because we are all oracles. Just for a few minutes. We're all oracles because when we speak from the word of the Lord, from the throne room, we act as an oracle. When we act as an oracle, we are speaking God's mind in his heart to us, you know. We um, we find out when we're an oracle that we should be able to hear God's noise, you know, God's voice. But it stops us, we have white noise. We have distorted thoughts. Because of white noise, we're so busy with the life that's going on that we don't hear. <clears throat> we, um, <clears throat> distorted thoughts from our past mm -hmm. and um, we pick up the wrong spirits either from ourselves or from the evils from the, from the dark side, right? Mm -hmm. And it runs around within us. So what happens is his promises that God is alive in us that we we're going to move in the spirit, that we're going to move above and not below. And all these things become more and more challenging. And what doesn't happen, we say, okay, what's wrong here? Why are we not winning? That we have to stop, and we have to struggle, and we have to work at what should be easy. Because we all know that wherever the anointing is, the anointing always what? Breaks the yoke. Breaks the yoke. So if the anointing is here, and is breaking the yoke, then we should be able to at any time call upon the Lord who is where? In us. In us. Okay, you're right. See, what happens is, as soon as I say we have to think for a minute, we forget that he's in us. Mm -hmm. And when he's, we think he's not in us, we then start calling out to him, and he's looking at us saying, what planet are you on? <laughs> and, because, let's face it, I'm in you. I put myself in you. Everything that you're ever going to need is within you. So what has he given us? What has God given us? Faith? What else? Come on. Well, the spiritual issues. Do you want to see Grace? <laughs> what are the things that he's given us? Foundationally. The Holy Spirit is within us. Yes. And if we read Galatians 5, yes. then we have love, peace, we have all of those gifts that we have to bring them to the, claim them That's right. as ours and not walk in the secular. Right. And we realize have, that they are alive within us and we just have to bring them, bring them to the And let's face it, what's, what's interesting is, is that while we have this within us, we forget that we've got it. Right. Somewhere right. between the time I read it and what I'm looking at right now, it is disappears in place. I mean, it does, you know, these white noises. But but white noise basically is a distraction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the best term I've heard for white noise is the um, terror of the now. When things happen now, they're pop ups, okay? And what happens is we, we get sidetracked. Yeah. And we get all wound up in something that's just happened. It totally wiped out what we planned to do that day. Mm -hmm. And we get off balance. How many of us have had a bad day where we've been off balance? Good start right. Uh, come on. 
We all do. Come on. <laughs> we all do. And what happens is that's his favorite trick. Our enemy's favorite trick is to keep it off balance so that we really don't start out with what we plan to do and what we'd hope to do and where we're going to go, right? Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen. And so we have to back up and we say, you know, if I can get beyond that point, I have somewhere to go. So when I speak as an oracle, I'm speaking as a what? Come on, what's an oracle? Uh, speaking God's word? Yeah, I am speaking as a word. I am a mouthpiece. Oh, mouthpiece. For God. That's what an oracle does. He speaks out the very word of God, what he does. So we have a mouthpiece. And besides having his mouthpiece, we have his power. And, you know, you're, you're picking up on the, the mic when you're talking. So, when we have the mouthpiece and we start speaking, we should be right from the throne room. Because when we think about it, if I'm speaking from the throne room, I'm th speaking from a position of authority. Sorry. No ifs, ands, buts, maybes, possibilities, whatever. It's done, right? It's already done. If we can speak with authority. If you go back to Elisha or Elijah, did they say, well, maybe possible if, well, well yeah. you know, if the plants get lined up and, and it doesn't rain or whatever, right? They just spoke it, right? Moses, did he have to, did he speak from a position of authority? Yes. Yeah. So here we have these guys um, in authority. Spoke, right? But they spoke differently than I speak. Why? People in authority in the Bible. In the Bible, if you watch how they speak versus how we normally speak and what we do, it's different. Well, God spoke directly to them, so they knew that they knew that they knew that they knew, so they, they spoke with that authority. We mm -hmm. are walking a lot in faith, so sometimes we don't walk as strong as we could. Yeah, no, that's true. And fears and all that kind of stuff. We have a fun attack. Yeah. Tom, uh, if, uh, depending on how far back you would go, would it, was it not more natural? for the believers uh, to really have the walk, what we walk around with of our Bible, they had it inside them. They memorized it. They knew the words of verse, <clears throat> and they, they had, um, it was part of the tradition, I guess, to be able to know the Word of God, because that became such a great part. Well, for a select group of Pharisees and Sadducees, that, that was true. For everybody else, they didn't know much of anything. And they really had no written documentation other than the few scrolls that they had in the synagogue that were handwritten. I think the difference is they believed it. They, they absolutely had believed it and had faith in it. I think that's true. But I, God had to prove it to them. He had to perform some miracles for Moses. To, uh, but... When we when we jump to the 400, well, uh, when the Jews were freed and Moses took them out of uh, their bondage, um, they, were, they were in disbelief because they spent 400 years basically in the land of idols and uh, the, the uh, Egyptian worship and gods that Egypt had. So there, before they ended up in bondage, I think that they were very strong, the people and the leaders were, but, but the bondage is kind of like they got free, but we're in this area right now. Is it much easier to say, like Satan tested Adam, hath God really said that? And so it's kind of like, well, Moses, you go up to the top of the mountain, you listen to God, and when you bring it back, we'll say, did he really say that? And so there's somehow disbelief got planted pretty heavy into the generations, I think, from, from that time on. Where we have to fight the disbelief, but they had to fire by night, and they had the clouds by day. Clouds by day. So there were manifestations that had to be presented to them for them to believe. They wouldn't have otherwise. But they still complained like crazy. In 40 years, they wanted to complain. Even with all that. With all that. Think about that. With all those manifestations, they complained. The Holy Spirit 
That's exactly the point. I mean, we have it so much better than they do. I know. We and we are not by the law any longer. That's also and, true. And so here we are. What man can build uh, a religion around God and put it in a box. But the truth is, God is mm -hmm. in that box. He will each one of us, and that we just have to believe the word. That we have it in our spirit all the time. That's right. So let's back up. And Moses couldn't have done anything unless the Holy Spirit came to him. Well, on, on him. On him. Oh, on him. It's Remember, it's not to him, it's on him. But in the Old Testament, the not Holy in him. Spirit it's on him. It came on different yeah. people. Yeah. Where now we have the, the awesome privilege of having that Spirit within us all the time. That's true. But think of it, having it on us versus in us. Um, that's a huge difference. We, if you listen to the average prayer today, somebody, they have an absolute conviction that Holy Spirit is not within them. Because their prayer is, well, God, come do this. God, go do that. God, do this. Please go do that. Pray for somebody else. Come, Holy Spirit. And all, you listen to all these prayers, which says, well, I don't have anything in me, so I just got to get somebody down here to get on me. And so we, we don't believe that's within us. Well, isn't that Satan's wonderful process of twisting the word of God? And once you twist that word of God, people start walking in a belief system that is really not true. My daughter just talked to her yesterday. She was in a, a, a vacation Bible Yep. And she said, it's amazing when they start asking questions about, well, how can God be in it? What, what, what's the Holy Spirit? What? With Jesus, what? And she said, "You know, when you start explaining it, it sounds goofy as heck. But yet, there's that 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 faith that builds up, and these little kids are open vessels. But yet, when they start asking the questions, you really go, boy, this is way out.' And, I think and it is supernatural is a little bit out there. Yeah. Sure. You know? Well, see, we're we're very easy to believe the supernatural with uh, Harry Potter." But very skeptical to believe in supernatural from Jesus Christ. <laughs> but if you start, <laughs> is that true or not? Yeah. If you reverse <laughs> that, if you reverse the thinking, that I think we all start out thinking we're this physical people, <clears throat> but the truth is we were spirits before we were being. That's right. And and if we start thinking about the fact that we are more spirit. The physical being. It's only what we see. So, if we're, I, we're right. more spirit. So, Rosemary, if I'm in tune with God, there's some things that should happen. Just remember, we will, in fact, I'm going through the list here. His word will come alive within us if we are listening to and in tune with Him. Mm -hmm. it, if, and the more we read the word, the more it comes alive in us and the more we see in it, right? We also see, it'll, it'll also it'll teach us how to move within the spirit. Because he's a great instructor, and one of the things we really need to rely on the Holy Spirit is, is to ask him how he wants us to move to most effectively accomplish what he's asked us to do, most effectively. Not asking him to go do it on his own, because he said, hey, I'm already within you. We shouldn't be hearing what God tells us, but also not in seeing signs and wonders, but I think most importantly for me, is that we have to move out of our ability into his ability. Mm -hmm. So we, what happens is, if we don't see something happening, and we're not prayed up, and we're not lathered up, and we're not whatever it is up, prayed up enough, we think we are inadequate. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But is it, if we think we're inadequate, it's about us, and it's not about him. I got this. That's the problem. That's right. see, it's not about us. It's all about him. And here we are getting all fired up and stuff that we haven't done this and we haven't done this and we got to do this and whatever. And then we pray for 20 minutes or half an hour, 45 minutes. We use kitchen sink prayers, right? We'll throw up everything against the wall and hope it sticks and then wait to see what happens. And what happens is nothing happens. And so what happens to us when we pray like that nothing happens? What happens to inside of us? Doubt. Doubt. Disbelief. Yes. Uh, we had a flood attack. It would be easier to believe that you could go to a faith healer and that 
because it's in him yeah. he can do something and so 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 <laughs> that's true <laughs> so think so here we have you know you hear me use the word fud right and it's befuddled and if you understand the dictionary meaning befuddled you understand what fud is which is fear uncertainty and doubt right and so we get fud attacks from the enemy and he beats us up about it all the time. And so when we're befuddled, we no longer feel grounded. We no longer feel secure. We no longer feel like we have strength, that we have authority. We, we're getting whipped around back and forth. And so we sign up for things, and we, we look on the outside saying, Oh, it didn't happen. I didn't do something right. You can't do anything right. It's all in him. True or not? True. true. Yeah. That is true, right? Okay. So if we listen to the Lord and we listen to the Spirit, we move with His wave of the move of the Holy Ghost, not against it or behind it. He wants us to surf on the front end power of the wave of the Holy Spirit. And so He's asking us to become superior surfers in the spirit world and follow wherever that wave is going. And if you've followed anything in the Scriptures, you know this Holy Spirit never sits still. It's always moving. And so we have to learn how to follow and instinctively, think about this, a surfer instinctively knows how to move with a wave. He doesn't think, well, let me think, now. I've got to get out my protractor here and figure out where I'm going to go next. He just does it. And so we really need to learn how to instinctively follow the Holy Ghost just as instinctively. Right? Ray's example of his move. Yeah. Uh, he's got a, he said we're going to follow the Holy Spirit and find out where we're just going from here to there to there. He's going to be showing us what to do. That's the process. And he is a so we and we get with him when he wants us and to. So having a close relationship God with God is the same as a surfer having a closer relationship with a wave. We know what's going to happen. We can feel it, we know it, we sense it, and we move with it, wherever it goes. And when that happens, how does a surfer feel when he's riding a great wave? Awesome. <laughs> but why is that any different than what we should be feeling when we're walking with this, the power of the wave of the Holy Ghost? That's right. We can even walk to the end of the board and hang ten. That's right. I mean, and if we're really out there, we're on our boogie board. We're, we're dancing and carrying on and praising the Lord and and doing like David did, right? Running around in our skimmies, you know, praising the Lord, running down the middle of the street. Which is true, right? Isn't that what it says? And his wife was not that happy about that either. <clears throat> so when we, when we think about being able to hang ten and to be able to move with the wave, and see, this is such a good analogy, is that the more in tune and the more perceptive and the more automatically I feel the move of the Spirit, the more I'll be able to do what He asked me to do. And that's the same thing with the wave. The more I learn how to surf, the better I'm at it. And by the way, the bigger challenges I can take where I'm, I'm running 30 foot waves out of the North Shore of Hawaii, when I started out, the three footer was just a little too big for me. <laughs> right? And as I graduate, you know, as I learn how to follow the Spirit and how to move with His power, the more adequate I am and more skilled I am, and I then become an expert surfer, or I should be a, an expert user of the, of the spirit. Hey, Tom, uh, <laughs> this last week, uh, the perfect analogy of what you're describing was a, uh, in Hawaii, a, a video that was a clip of a father teaching the son how to surf, and the son was only four years old. Wow. And so, uh, you know, and the, the camera was on the front, connected to the front of the board, yeah. and it was just exactly what you're saying. The father wants to teach us how to get on that board and how right. to stand up and how to That's right. And see, that surfboard is the platform that the Holy Ghost gives to us. In the, He is our platform. He is our surfboard. The Spirit of the Lord is our surfboard, and we are to ride him wherever he's going. And, and to me, it's just its just so God that you use the wave, because my understanding is water does represent the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, you can certainly use that, but 
repeat uh, questions we won't hear. Actually, you're the only one that has a microphone. Okay. So the rest of us are really not heard as well unless we speak louder. Well, but it says <laughs> that, the, that the water represents the, 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 the Holy Spirit. And this analogy works well because we should be able to ride the Holy Spirit's power or water or wave. And we speak of the next coming, the new, next infilling, the next revival as the wave of the Holy Ghost sweeping across the land. So there's a lot of analogies that we use with it, but I find that the fact of, if I understand, really understand surfing, I understand how to operate with the Holy Spirit. I instinctively learn how to do it. I, and by the way, I'm very intimate with that wave. I'm not standing off at 30 feet thinking, wow, I wonder how this is going to work, right? <clears throat> I, <laughs> I'm in the middle of it, right? And by the way, person, periodically I'll crash and burn. Is that okay? Sure. Get up and jump back in the spirit again on my board and away we go. As long as you don't hit the rocks. That's right. And that's what Satan would like us to believe. Because we're not trying to do it in our ability, right? And when we try to do it in our ability, why is that, by the way? Why do we want to do it in our ability? Pride. Yes. I think pride is the answer. That when we find out that pride in itself is the rocks, that we face when we surf. Yeah. And there's sharp things up sitting all and they're all hidden by the way. You can't see these suckers. You're flying in on a on the, the wave of the Holy Ghost and the spirit of the wave, and I don't see those hidden dangers. Right? And so I get so full of myself I'm no longer looking for the the, the markers as I'm coming ashore where those things are. And I'm not watching the markers of the Holy Spirit telling us Watch out! Watch out! And then all of a sudden, we land ourselves in the, up on a rock somewhere, right? And we normally, when we hit a rock, it what? Hurts? <laughs> <That's good. laughs> It'd be devastating. I think there's a lot of social conditioning um, as we grow up. But how social conditioning in that respect was, Mary? Uh, in that, when, when, as we are raised, we are raised to take control of circumstances, to, to um, you know, whether it's from our parents or from our church or from our school, it's, uh, we're always taught that, that if you do these things, this will happen. And that in order to fit within society, you're, you, you are conditioned to do certain things to make certain things happen. I, and I think what happens is that because we're not taught there's any spirit within us, it's all us. That's true. It becomes <clears throat> very uh, narcissistic. And, and so every people walk around thinking it's them. And because uh, you'll hear people say, well, that person over there has those problems because they didn't work hard enough. They didn't do <coughs> what sin did they what sin did they judge not that you can judge. But I mean what we normally say, okay, they did some kind of a sin because look what happened to them. God's punishing them. But, Ever heard that? But what happens then <coughs> is when you realize that you're a spiritual <coughs> being first yeah. and God lives within you. His spirit is alive within you, and you have the power and authority that, that he gives you. You have his righteousness. You have his truth. Um, all of a sudden, those other things become dimmer. Well, that's true. So your segue into conditioning for God's best, which if we follow on with our, what we have talked about, is to be an oracle of God, we have to be able to be conditioned to hear what he's doing. That this is a process that is not an event. And would you not say that that conditioning is exactly what uh, uh, Rosemary <coughs> excuse me, mentioned was we're taught to be prideful. We are rewarded for what we did. And so <coughs> we've got to undo the pride portion and understand who did it through us. Amen. <coughs> That's true. In, in him I trust. Right. Over and over. Right. Right. But, and if we are conditioned 
by the Lord if we allow him to be his will and not our will, which is what it is. If I look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says that's that's a reasonable service. It's to be able to do not my will but his will, which is a living sacrifice. And if we do those things on a daily basis, it will enable us to bear much fruit because now I'm using him. It's his sanctification, it's not mine. It's his purity, it's not mine. It's his power, it's not mine. Right? It's his righteousness, it's not mine. And once I understand that, and we really understand what that means, I'm out of the equation. My only job is to be the fire hose. His job is to take care of it. <laughs> so what rest there is in that? Yeah. I mean, we all walk in our tension and our stresses and our having to do <clears throat> And even as believers, and we know this, we still don't always do it. So, if for us to be sanctified, right? And that sanctification says, "I'm now, I'm sanctified because of what? Who lives in me? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what sanctified me. And I'm washed by the blood. I am perfect. I cannot get any better." Right? I'm there. So going ahead with that. If we drain ourselves and make room for the Holy Spirit, power and reside and manifest to be cloaked in his power, right? He's within me. I am sanctified. Good morning. How you doing? <clears throat> we need to be single minded, right? And what is mean single minded? Let's go back over and make sure because these are the things that are important to us to remember. What is being single minded? Our spirit mind and our physical mind line up. Would an example be a magnifying glass gathering the sun and burning the hole? Would that be a true focus of the power? We have the ability to focus the power of the, of the Holy Spirit to what we speak. And when I speak it, I focus it. Be healed. I focus what is already within me to a specific thing to fix their cancer, whatever. doesn't matter. So the answer is absolutely yes. When we focus on it, something, when I look at this, I, by what I speak, I focus and I create. This is wild. Mm -hmm. When you think about it. Whatever I speak is what I get. Right? So moving ahead, so if we're sanctified and we're focused, okay, and being single-minded, right? Remember this. I've got my mind, and I've got the Spirit's mind, right? Mm -hmm. If I have two different minds that don't agree, I'm double-minded. And whenever I'm double-minded, always, there's what? Confusion. Unbelief. You're absolutely right. I cannot believe something when I'm double-minded, because I don't know which is right. It's impossible for me, Right? It's impossible for me. So when I have one come to the other like this, perfectly, no matter if I'm looking from the spirit side or from my soul side in my own mind, they're mirror images of each other. And in unity, the, the scriptures say, I can do anything. And we, once we understand that being single-minded is to be in unity with the spirit's will, and my mind is the same as his, it will always happen. Not maybe, not 80%, 100% always. It'll happen. And when it doesn't happen, it's very simple for us to understand that I'm not in his will. And his will includes his timing. So one of the things we always ask is, Lord, is this the right time? Right? Is it me? Is it me? Is it my, do I have the anointing? God, have you called me? In this situation, right? Is it now? Is this the moment that you want this to take place? If it isn't right now, Lord, when is it? You know, by the way, what's your strategy? Because you're infinite, and I'm not, and you have a zillion ways to do it that I can't even comprehend. Tell me what those things are, and I know that when you give me the strategy, I always win. Go back to Old Testament. Every time a king listened to the Lord and asked, or a prophet, it always worked. When they decide they're going to do it the same way they did last time, what happened? 
they got a bloody nose. They got worked over, right? And so as long as they ask, always ask for the strategy of the Lord, it'll always happen. So that takes us to our, using our power station. And what I did is I will increase this out. And this is another part of the teaching, which I'm going to pass out here. And this is called the power of the blood. Your belief system's true foundation. <laughs> and <clears throat> this is really interesting. When I was quiet before the Lord, I'm saying, you know, what is it that, that we need to make sure we have is a foundation? You know, if we're not seeing something happen in our own life, or when we <clears throat> are trying to talk to somebody else, one of the things that our major responsibility for somebody to grow in, in the Lord as a Christian, is to give them a firm foundation. You know, we can sprinkle water on them and do these things and say, go, go, go to it, right? Is that much of a foundation? Yes or no? no I don't think so. Word. The word has to be yeah. <clears throat> You know, so there's a whole group that says dip and do. <clears throat> dip them and then go do it. <laughs> and it just doesn't work that way. So when we stop and we see power in the blood, and one of the things I really have observed, and I write it the very first thing, is, is that Christians, many, never let the Bible get in the way of what they want to believe. Think about that. <laughs> many Christians never let the Bible get in the way of what they want to believe. They'll twist it, they'll move it around, they'll do, but they won't believe it, because it doesn't fit with what they want. And so, we always go back to the scriptures. If we go back to the scriptures, okay, we can look and see what's happening. And the scriptures should do it. And Tom, would you say that the maybe a good example would be looking at the Mo, at Moses' situation again, the promised land, he sent out 12, and 10 came back with a bad report. Well, yeah. they let they let the, um, their abilities to be dictate what they could or could not do. The circumstance. They look at the circumstance what would God put in them. They didn't believe the source. You know, 12 went out, 10 came back, and they didn't believe the source of why they went out in the first place. Because they were already told before that you will, you will take the land. It will all be yours. You're going to kill all the chance. You're going to do all this stuff. So it was, this was not looking into. They saw the end of the book. Yeah. They still didn't believe it. My, my take on that, because I've given this particular story out, is that they saw it as God saw it. Period. That's it. They had the anointing. They saw it as God saw it. Came back with His report, not man's report. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The, we'd rather look at our own logic, our tradition, or experience, experiences, okay, to formulate our own theology that supports our personal self-healing needs. Listen to me. We come up with our own theology for our own self-healing. <laughs> In other words, uh, if it didn't work for us, it must not be God. That's right. Exactly. So, I, therefore, I'm going to create one that works. Right. Okay? So, I create my own theology, right, that accommodates myself, my needs for myself, as well as accommodate my soul and flesh desires. Does it have value? It goes back to that again. And if it has value for me, I'm going to create something that will work for me. It's wild. You're building pride. You're putting, you're, you're tucking away every prideful moment that you can. That's right. Glory in your work. So we can agree. With, see, if someone go look at Mark seven thirteen. Because what we're seeing in operation is what it says in Mark seven thirteen. Making the word of God of no effect through your traditions, which you have handed down and. Many such things we do. As many such things we do. So what we do in our traditions, our old stinking thinking, is what stops, okay, uh, and, and, and we will not do what God says for us to do in the Bible. Because it, it, it violates my tradition. 
Now that tradition also, by the way, well, can be theology. I think some of the hardest nuts to crack are somebody who are, are, are very spiritually the, theologians that have a lot of brain power but have no common sense. Intellect. Tons of intellect. And they can they can argue you until you're you gray in the, the grave. In the, somewhere in the New Testament, I remember reading that tradition was the biggest obstacle to faith. Mm -hmm. And I... I don't know where it is well, right now. See if we can find it. But that is true. Now here's one that's going to make your toes, your toes curl. There are also traditions instituted by God that will make his word of no effect for us today. It read it. Read it. It's right in front of you. <laughs> the, all, the, the old, under the old law. That's right. Those traditions are not. Those are traditions. And so we're, let's talk about those. Old versus New Testament. The Old Testament way of relating to God is not the same as the New Testament way of having a relationship with God. Very true. Totally different. And so you hear preached Old Testament mixed with New Testament and thrown together in this, this slime ball that comes flying out of the pulpit. And you're trying to figure out which part's true. Because they're both true, and they're double-minded. So when I hear Old, Old Testament and New Testament slime together, I've got unbelief. Because you don't know what to believe. Because there's two belief systems that are wrapped together in this one snowball. They're getting pitched at you. Think about that. And you can start listening to hear whether their, their foundation is one of, of Old Testament law or New Testament grace. And you'll hear people just hammer you, Old Testament law. Just hammer the daylights out, and you walk away. And one would, as in certain denominations, every week or every two weeks, you go back down to rededicate yourself because you would beat up again. That's on our cruise at the Jewish fallacy. Don't most uh, you Christian churches not study the Old Testament or believe that it has value? And I said, no, the old and the new have to go together and are all one. That's all I said. Yep. And that's true that we even have the reputation in the churches of not reading the Old Testament, believing anything of it. Well, we're not to believe in the law, but everything's connected, so that's that right. isn't true. So we can't separate them. So the Old Testament is legalistic and based on our performance. It's all perform. The Old Test Testament is performance based. Okay. The New Testament, on the other hand, is a covenant of grace based on acceptance and belief of what Jesus really did for us on the cross. The power of His blood shed is active today for you and I. That's the key that I want us to put into place. We have to understand what that is. Today's church does not talk much about the blood of Christ or what effect it has and how much power there is in the blood. We don't hear much about it. Even when we talk about much explanation of that in, for communion. Repeat that. Even when we speak about having taken communion, you do not hear a lot of, of exposing of the power of the blood in the wine. It's really interesting. It's for, for just a remembrance of... of yeah. Jesus, which is true. That's true, but it but doesn't talk about what he did. <laughs> to keep us in the true faith. Absolutely. I, I think of that in the Lutheran confession about the fact that, that communion strengthens our faith. And when I go to communion, I always, most of the time, I sit down and I remind myself, you have received strength to go on your walk through our faith of the body and blood of Christ. That's right. And I, 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 I remind myself of that, because otherwise it's just a ritual that you're remembering something. It's more than yeah. that. You know, Hebrews is a book, kind of an overview of, to the, of what happened in the Old Testament and what we're supposed to believe in the New Testament. And I picked out Hebrews 10, uh, 16 through 23, which is kind of a really a high level 
And this is the covenant that I have made with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my love into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of, of this there is, there is no more offering of, for sin. There is no more offering of sin, okay? Or for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the blood of Je by the blood of Jesus, okay? By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, in heaven on high priest over the house of God, let us draw, no, draw near with a true heart in the full measure of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. No one can have an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And if you could take that paragraph, we could embed that into us, into our belief system. We'd understand what we have and we're walking with. Because that's a mouthful when you go through what it just said. Because we are no longer having any sin in our bodies, right? <clears throat> Under the old covenant, a sacrifice had to be offered every time a sin was committed, right? Then there was the day of uh, atonement. And I have been to the high holy days for the day of atonement. I've gone through those. And that was a sacrifice made by the high priest for everyone and everything, just in case something was missed. <laughs> That's what that was. That's what it was supposed to be. Yeah. Can't have one. If I have one little thing, you're done, right? There's one spot 11, the bread's done. And so the day of atonement did that. At least they had a belief that you had to be absolutely perfect in everything you did to follow the law. Because exactly one right. tiny item would nullify the whole thing. Absolutely. Because what that all did is pointed to Jesus. That's right. Perfect. However, at all point. that's right. These were all sacrifices of types or shadows of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. And that we see in Hebrews 9, 8 through 12, and 24 to 28. He talks about that, okay? So when, when I can get that in my mind, that says what I am, I can start to understand and start to, to, we should be bloodhounds. We should sniff law versus grace. And I mean, we have to smell it and, and not let it go into us. Jesus, your Lord, you become a new creature and sin is no longer an issue between you and God. Right. I cannot sin in my spirit. Amen. Okay. By which we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay? And Hebrews 10 4 says, For the one by one offering he has performed forever that that those that are sanctified. It is finished. It is done. It's finished. Mm -hmm. I cannot go back under the law. I cannot ever go back there. What happens? Because if I do, I'm under the law. What happens if I, <laughs> I, I commit a, a sin? What am I to do? What's it say to do? What's the scripture say? Well, my, my creed says confess unto your sins and ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness. That's the tradition that I've been taught. And here's where it gets really exciting. Because if, because it also says that my spirit is 100% pure. When the Holy Spirit arrives in me and lives in my spirit, I have no sin in me. None. That's and, that's that's one part, but remember, I'm a three-part body. So I got I'm a, got a perfect part sitting over here in my spirit, mm -hmm. and then I'm I'm for the rest of my life I'm trying to bring my soul and my flesh in line. <laughs> and so the question that you propose is one that can't be answered directly, because I will tell you that you have no sin in your life if I look at your spirit. But at the same time. My flesh does sin. That's correct. Yeah. So what do I do with that? Well, could I, I, could, I, could I ask and say <laughs> that would that sin appear as the, the one who said, hath God said? In other words, are we not still going to have an attack, as long as we're on this earth, of the enemy trying to deceive us? He comes and kill, steal, and destroy. So you see, any of those three things happening in your life, you've got to back up and say, I know where it comes from. And he may want you to believe that it's coming through your knowledge. Hmm. He wants you to believe, and uh, he wants you to, you know, take take the blame for it. 
when it is this thing that is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. You are a true belief. Because you have the free will also. And that's Get also behind me, Satan, is a good one. So we have to know our authority in order to fulfill that. Would we not? That's true. I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm running through a lot of scriptures right now. Yeah, me too. And 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 what comes to my mind is, if I am to repent, which is what this is all about. <coughs> repentance, by definition, is what being sorry. For. Turn, 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 turn completely around. Oh, I don't no, agree. New thinking. New what? New thinking. <laughs> new thinking. Repentance is new thinking. See, I can repent for never, forever. And never have new thinking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Any turn it around. So I, that is not repentance. Repentance is new thinking. The only way I get, and I'm going back to this thought process, because the only way I get new thinking is to let the power of the word work on me to to rechange my programming that's in my soul mind from the power of the spirit and the power of the word coming in and changing my thinking. Right? When I have repented, when I have repented, okay? Think about this. I have new thinking. So we are. And the old has gone away, and behold, the new has come. Hi, Wendy. Okay? Think about that. So, please repeat the, the last, uh, what you last said. When I have repented, behold, the old has gone away, and behold, the, and now the new has come. I am now a new creature. I'm a new creature instantly in my spirit. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. The old man has passed away, and now the new has come. Now I move over here, and that has been manifested in a part of my body or soul to where I'm now a new creature. I've signed up, and I have new thinking to that. But we recognize when we sin through the Ten Commandments. See, and, and we recognize. So here's where I get really hung up on this. Why, when I ask for forgiveness, it's worthless until I repent. Then I have new thinking. Sorry for yes. See, so we can go on forever saying I'm sorry for. It. So I have a real hard time when I hear this this word repentance because repentance is a is a easy way out. Well, you can go to. <laughs> Confession, Confession forever. <laughs> right. I repent. Christine. So, how do you explain it then when Christ has forgiven all sin, but yet we're humans of sin, yes. we need to repent? Yes. How do you explain that? Okay, so how do I, re let me rephrase this. How do I, say that again. How do you explain being all sin forgiven, but yet in human okay, remember, all sin is forgiven in my spirit. The question was, is how do I, how do I justify or put together the fact that all sin has been re, re, has been forgiven, and yet I go out and sin? And that's the th the tri part of us. I got my spirit, which is pure. There's no sin in me, but I got my soul and my body, and my flesh that are doing war, right? And it, they go off and sin, right? And so now I say. I'm sorry, I repent, right? But it's not true repentance because it talks about in the scriptures that God only signs up for true repentance. It talks about true repentance, those words, right? Well, true repentance is new thinking. I no longer do it the way I did it before. No sin, no more. Right. That's what Jesus said. That's new thinking. Now, until I do that, I'm still sinning. And until I believe that I no longer am going to do that, hmm? but it's always forgiven. It's always forgiven. But but think about it. Until I do that, there's been no true repentance ever. It's just been delayed, put on hold, or never. People die and they never repented. Though they they have repented up their eyeballs and confessed daily. So, <laughs> so you can be full of sin and be forgiven, but you need to. And have new thinking. We have to have new thinking, which is is moving away from. Okay, is moving away from. We have figured out a pretty slick way of of getting rid of the guilt without ever repenting. 
Confession. Confession lets me get rid of the, the guilt that I can go back and sin again. <laughs> Think about that. It is a slick way for me to take get rid of all the, the baggage that I got. Oh, I'm okay. And go back and sin the next day. But I've never repented. Because do repentance by definition is new thinking. And do you have to confess that in order to be repentant? You have to act, you have to live it. You're only repentant when you live it. Faith without works is dead. I'm, I'm not getting from here to there without doing that. And so we live this. This is a really interesting game that we play. <laughs> Isn't this true? The Lord's prayer, and it says, forgive us our sins. Right. As we forgive those who have sinned against us. So in the, if we wind this up, it's my decision by having a new way of thinking. The only way I can, the only way I can forgive somebody else is I personally have new thinking. That's the definition of new thinking. Because I've forgiven somebody else for the very thing that was held against me. Think about that one. That's good, guys. That was a good class. I appreciate it. And who wants to close in prayer? Go. Okay, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to come together in prayer. Your word says we're two or more gathered than you are in the midst of us. Father, I know that you are here and are so present. Thank you for the blood of Christ Jesus that we shed for the remission of our sins, Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that indwells, that guides us, directs us, and leads us us into righteousness, Father, and just thank you for Tom, for that he's taking the time, Father, to carefully select what he, and choose, Father, what he is to teach here, Father, and that we, um, that, and that we willingly, Father, uh, understand, and that, and that you find a way, Father, if there is any disorder, Father, that you find a way, Father, into, um, into, um, gentleness, and uh, righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 We turn it off. Let's